even though I've just discussed this topic of competitive advantage for pretty many times, I've prepared a lot of new material that I thought hopefully would be interesting to you. But one thing never changes in my discussion about this topic. And that is, there are four basic beliefs that, that empower and inform all of the work that I do. They were the inspiration for the book that I wrote in 1995. And they go like this. The first belief is, overwhelming people are good. And they want to do a good job. They want to improve. They want to grow. The second belief is, Everyone is good at something. Everyone has an expertise. Everyone has special knowledge. And it's the, the job of the leader to find out what that knowledge, what that expertise is. And is. The third belief is the greatest motivator in the workplace is meaningful work. You know how that feels. When you go home at the end of the day, know that what you did was meaningful. Know that what you did made a difference. Have that feeling of having done meaningful work. The greatest motivator in the workplace. And the fourth belief is that people and purpose and profit are not mutually exclusive business concepts. Let me talk about purpose earlier today. Very, very important. Okay, so now that we have the introduction out of the way, I would like to begin with a very simple exercise. It's an exercise that I learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Lewis Patrick. Uh, actually, it's been over 20 years ago. And he's used this exercise many, many times with his audiences, and so have I. So it's a, it's a very simple exercise, and it's a very simple question. And the question is, which letter is most out of place? And I, I don't want to dwell long on this, but if anybody has an answer of which letter, just please raise your hand and, and give me a reason. Yes, Mario? G. G. Why is G? Because it has a hook going down. Okay. Any other answer? The C? It hasn't got a connection to it. Very good answer. But I know that's all. Awesome. Is, is there another answer? G? G? Y. That's also a very good answer. Yes. Also, C has an open loop. C has an open loop, yes. Those are all excellent answers. So here's the question. Why is it so hard to see the key? Why do we not see the key? Does anyone have any idea why? Yes. No. Anyone have a Well, from my experience, there are three good reasons why we don't see the key. The first one is, we don't see what we're not prepared to see. We don't see what we're not looking for. And quite often we don't see or hear what we don't want to see. Isn't that correct? Doesn't that have to do with the stories we tell us? Doesn't it have to do with the mindsets that we develop, the beliefs and the stories? And so when I asked you the question, when I said which letter of most is most out of place, I didn't say which of the four letters quadrants. I simply said which letter. I left it to you to construct a story in your mind about the question I was asking. So it's very difficult to construct a different story. Once our mind locks in on an idea or a set of parameters or a set of beliefs, it's very difficult to change that. So, Have we, have we all had this experience in our lives where we believe one thing about another person? We believe a set of circumstances. We 
you believe a problem is able to be solved or not able to be solved? Do we walk in on one idea or another? And so just like this picture, if we lock in on the idea that it's a horse, then we lose the ability to see that simply by rotating at 90 degrees in one direction, it's a frog. Isn't that true of corporation? It's true of ourselves individually. But isn't that true also of organization, corporation, locking in on ideas? Let me give you an example. It's right out of the news if you read what's going on in the United States. General Motors. Is anyone familiar with the news about General Motors in the United States? It's, it's this. General Motors is facing hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars of lawsuits for wrongful debts because 15 years ago, they redesigned an ignition system that was failed, but they failed to tell the public. They failed to even make note of the change on the drawings and prints. They made the change, didn't tell anybody, and so now 15 years later, there are right now at least 13 deaths, and there will probably be many more as a result of this ignition failure. So how does that happen in a corporation? It happens because they build up ideas. They build up ideas about what's right, what's wrong, what questions are we allowed to ask, what questions are we not allowed to ask. And over time, they develop a culture. Now there was some great research done about how corporations develop culture and how this mindset begins and where it leads to. And I'll tell the story very quickly. So about 20, 20 or 30 years ago, some researchers put five apes in a room. And they put a ladder in the middle of the room and they hung a string of bananas from the, from the ceiling above the ladder. And they closed the door and they waited to see what the apes would do. So of course, it didn't take long. One of the apes said, I want some bananas. So he started to the ladder and actually started up the ladder. And as soon as he got halfway up the ladder, the researchers turned on the spigots and they flooded the room with ice cold water. Of course, the reaction of the apes was to huddle back in the corner, shiver, cold. They turned the water off. And in a few minutes, another ape started toward the ladder. And of course, the researchers turned the water back on, scared the apes. And they learned that going after the bananas was not a good idea. So what did they do next? They took one of the monkeys out of the room and replaced it with a new monkey. So what do you think that monkey did? Of course, the new monkey went for the bananas. What do you think the other four monkeys did? They grabbed the ape. They threw, threw him down off the ladder and beat him up because they didn't want to get soaked again. So they continued this experiment until they had traded one monkey at a time. And now all five monkeys that were in the room, none of them had been in the original set of monkeys which had had the cold water spray. But they had all learned the behavior. And when yet another monkey was introduced, reaction was the same. They attacked him, pulled him down off the ladder, and beat him up. The interesting thing is, none of those monkeys had any idea why they were doing it. They simply knew that they had learned the behavior from the other monkeys. The culture had developed that going after the bananas was not a good idea. And so they learned and shared this behavior. So that's how culture de develops in organizations over decades. People learn behavior. They learn how to think about problems. They learn how to think about each other. They learn how to dress. They learn how to act. Now there's a very well-known saying that culture is to the organization just as water is to the fish. The fish doesn't realize it's in water. It doesn't see the water. Yet the water is the method of propulsion. It's, it's resistance. And it provides the very oxygen that provides life. Yet the fish doesn't realize it's in water. 
And that's very much the same with large organizations and culture. Don't realize it's there, but it affects everything that's, that we do, everything we think, and especially about what we're capable of. Someone earlier today used the same slide. No problem can be solved from the level of consciousness that created it. So let's think in a, in a larger context about the level of consciousness. About not just about ourselves as individuals and the beliefs that we construct, or, or even organizations and, and the ideas that form culture, but let's think even larger. Let's think about industry in general, manufacturing in general, corporations in general. Let's think about the entire industrial age. The level of consciousness that's developed as a result evolving from the industrial age over 100 years ago. What are some of the, the beliefs? What are some of those stories that are told within organizations and have been for decades and decades? Well, of course, there's a story of power and authority and control. There's the story of coerced compliance. I will pay you so much, you will do this, you will do no more. It's a transaction. It's not a relationship. The whole idea of scientific management, F.W. Taylor, who created the whole science of scientific management, management back in the early 1900s, the structure of work, the man who created the basis for all industrial engineering. The focus on shareholders only, and this is interesting because it's only in the last five or ten years that the idea that the shareholders are the only and primary focus it's only recently that that's been challenged. We'll talk about that in a few minutes when we talk about conscious capitalism. A scarcity mentality. And that basically means I believe that there's only so much. And if I have more, you have less. As opposed to an abundance mentality. It means we can grow the pie. We don't have to deal with a constant size pie. We can grow the pie. Either or thinking, binary thinking, either black or white, either this or that. It doesn't allow for a thinking of both and, both this and that. It can be a combination of things. The whole idea of growth at any cost, consumption of resources, and disposal of waste. That's being challenged now, of course, by sustainability. And then the last one is people simply as cogs in the machinery. As a result of F.W. Taylor's work creating scientific management, we do this motion repetitively over and over and over again, and it should take you only 0.7 seconds, and then you do the next motion, and the next motion, and the next motion. This is the traditional industrial age level of consciousness, and it's created the situation that we have in corporations today. So, for all the history majors in here, what do we generally refer to uh, that period from the Roman Empire to the mid 1300s? The Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages, right? Of course, the Dark Ages. What event do we think of in gruesome terms when we think about the Dark Ages? Crusades. Uh, well, the Crusades is a good answer. It was even mentioned twice earlier today. The Black Death. Yeah, yes. So, the plague. Yes. 
So, here's the question. Well, here's the answer, actually. A more recent form of the Black Death is evidence today in the lifespan of organization. The average life expectancy of multinationals, 40 years or less. The average life expectancy of all corporations, 12 years or less. In my mind, that's definitely a form of Black Death. But there's an even closer to home, a more recent phenomenon that's been getting a lot of publicity. I'm sure everyone has read about it. And there was a survey recently done in 2013 by Gallup talking about engagement. You read and hear a lot about employee engagement. These are some pretty stark numbers, I think, representing another form of Black Death. Only 13% of the workforce actively engaged. 63% of the workforce passive or neutral. 24% of the workforce actively disengaged, which means they're neutral and they're proud of it, or they're passive and they don't care. I think that's a pretty astounding statistic. What about Italy? Italy's a little better, but not much. Again, Gallup did this survey in 2013, a global survey. We have the data for every country. And the United States is not immune either. They found that in the United States, 88%, 88% of Americans feel that they work for a company that doesn't care about them as a person, doesn't care, cares about their hands, but doesn't care about art, mind, or their creativity, or their ideas, or their innovation, or their engagement, or their ability to perform discretionary work. So, here's the question. How long would you keep your job if you were the vice president of engineering for a $10 billion company? And if only 13% of the machinery and equipment that you installed and designed in all your plants, if only 13% of it was effective and productive and running at or above standard, how long would you keep your job? Days. Only for days. Two days. Yes, two days. Maybe not two days. Huh? So if you were the vice president of marketing, and only 13% of the advertising and customer interactions that you designed were effective, in creating repeat customers, how long would you keep your job? If you were the vice president of sales, and only 13% of your customers, again, were repeat customers and were profitable, how long would you keep your job? No, you wouldn't keep your job. So the question is, if that's true in these other disciplines, then why do we tolerate, why do we continue to tolerate the situation where only 13% of the workforce is fully engaged. It proves that this industrial age thinking is simply not sufficient. It's not adequate to keep up with the complexity and the speed of today's business. We need to think differently. Back to the title of the presentation. We need to think differently about people in the workplace and how we engage them. So, what do you see in front of me? Pretty simple, huh? A gray square. Yes. And so, if, if I'm looking at a group of people, and if I'm standing far enough back, that's what I see. But the interesting thing is, this is the exact same picture. But it's magnified 10,000 times, so that I can see the individuals see the pixels. So if I'm looking at people as a group, those people over there, that ethnic group, those employees from that company, the people that live in that town, I can think of them in very gray terms. I can think of them as all the same. But until we actually look at them more closely, Remember that second belief. Everyone is really good at something. And if we don't take the time as a leader to think about 
about what that something is and to explore and investigate it and then utilize it, how much of that resource are we wasting? It's no wonder that only 13% of the workforce is actually engaged. So we're talking about the rebirth of things. We've got to break out of the industrial age mindset, those industrial age beliefs, those industrial age stories, and have a rebirth of thinking. And of course, rebirth is just another way of saying what other word. Again, back to our history books. What great event took place around 1350? The Renaissance. I heard Renaissance. Yes, absolutely. The Renaissance. There's a hint. The Renaissance began around 1350. And most historians agree that it took place in Florence. It began in Florence. And it was at the end of the plague. The plague had ravaged Europe and killed anywhere from a, a third to a half population. Black death. And out of that black death came a rebirth of thinking, came the Renaissance. So, so how do we get a new Renaissance, a new rebirth of thinking that we're able to empower and lead? I'm going to refer to two great American presidents. The first one is Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln said, and of course you know some of the, the thinking that Abraham Lincoln was facing in those days. He said we must think anew and act anew because we have new circumstances, we have new challenges. We have to think differently. Another great American president, Dwight Eisenhower, he gave a whole new spin to leadership. And this was a man who was a military leader. And you would think that a military man would be very, very authoritarian, very command and control, very top down. But Eisenhower was not that way. Eisenhower said that leadership is influencing others to do what you want, but for their own reasons, not for your reasons. Because guess what? People don't do things for your reasons. They do them for their own reasons. So if you're going to inspire discretionary effort. If you're going to inspire creativity, you have to figure out what are their reasons. There's been a lot of research done on what motivates people in the workplace. And there are five that come to mind very quickly. The first one is, we talked about it earlier, what I do makes a difference. Meaningful work. The second one is, my efforts are recognized and rewarded. My abilities are utilized, developed, and grown. We have a little translation problem here from PC to half of that. The fourth one is, I'm trusted and valued as a person. Remember that American statistic? 88% of American workers believe that they work for a company that doesn't care about them as a person. And the last one is, I believe I have a stake in the outcome that if I do something above and beyond, that there will be some kind of reward, some kind of recognition in it for me. Back to that idea of meaningful work. It's the number one source of happiness in the workplace. And that was a, another finding that came out of the Gallup poll. So, what does all this mean? It begs the question, why is engagement then so important? It's really a very clear answer. Research proves over and over again that companies that proactively take steps to enlighten leadership, to engage their workforce, have incredibly more superior performance results, measurable performance results. So let's bring it back full circle. The topic of today's meetings is being without borders. Being without limitations. So what does this have to do with me? Well, one of our earlier speakers defined lean for it. It's the elimination of waste, is it not? It's the use of tools. But what good are those tools if they don't engage human minds? Discretionary effort. Is everyone familiar with the term discretionary effort? It's very simple. It's what people do that they don't have to do. 
It's discretionary. It's their choice to think about a problem. It's their choice to come up with a creative solution. It's their choice to participate in a team problem solving effect. And you can't do that without engagement. Because we have to go back to what we said a few minutes ago. People, people do things for their own reasons, not for your reasons. So we have to always, as, as conscious, inspirational leaders, we have to always keep that idea in front of us. So that leads to the most important slide in the whole thing. If you don't remember anything else about today, please remember these two indisputable truths. And the first one is, your competitors may outspend you in any facet of your organization, any facet of your company. They can outspend you on machinery, equipment, advertising, research, IP. There's someone out there who can outspend you. The other thing is that they, they, they can't possibly buy, nor can they compel an engaged workforce. And so that leaves it to you to tap into the untapped creativity and enthusiasm because that untapped, dormant enthusiasm and creativity is a sustainable, ongoing, almost limitless source of competitive advantage in the workplace. And it's virtually free. If only 13% or if only 20 or 30% of the workforce is actively engaged, that leaves you another 70, 60, 50% actively engage and actively tap into this untapped source of competitive advantage virtually free. And as we all know, that requires change. What are the, what are the things we know about change? What, what, does anybody have a, an idea about what is the first thing we think of when we think of change? It's very difficult, right? Change is very, very difficult. In fact, most companies that I'm aware of and worked with over the years, the very first reaction to change is, if I'm quiet enough, and if I'm still, it won't find me. Maybe I can hide. What did Darwin say about change? Darwin said, it is not the most intelligent of the species. Nor is it the largest and the strongest that will survive and adapt. It is a species that is adaptable to change that will flourish and prosper. Think about that. Okay, change. What do we see here? Looks like we see some folks changing the light bulb. So that, that begs the question, one of my favorite questions. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Does anybody know how many psychologists it takes to change a light bulb? Zero. Zero. Okay. You must have good light bulbs. Okay, the answer is this. It only takes one. But the light bulb has to really, really want to change. <laughs> okay? Now, that's a great joke. I, I, I've used it many, many times. It's one of my favorites. But the question is, is it possible to actually want to change? Because as we know, one of the first reactions to change is pretend that it's not there and hope that it goes away, right? So is it possible to actually want to change? As individuals, when do we want to change? We want to change when something that we believe or something we do is causing enough damage that we're finally tired of the damage and we decide to do something about it, right? How do organizations change? Why would organizations want to change? Well, fortunately, there's a lot of great statistical evidence for wanting to change. And I'm going to go through this quickly because there's a lot of data on these slides. I believe Good referred earlier to Industry Week magazine. Industry Week magazine is actually headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm from. And it's they publish, I believe, all over the world in all different industries. But every year in North America, they run a competition, a best plants competition. And so hundreds of companies send in their applications with all their data to talk about the results that they get, the performance metrics, but also how they conduct business, how they lead, how they engage. 
And then every year they pick 25 finalists and then 10 best plants. So over the last 20 years, as they've been accumulating data from all these plants, 20 year period, this is the kind of results in cost and productivity that they're able to generate among these best plants. Cost reduction, uh, productivity improvement, uh, cost change for unit. These are, I think you will agree with me, are incredible results. In terms of quality and delivery, defect reduction, manufacturing cycle time reduction, reduction in customer reject rates. Again, incredible results from these plants. In terms of safety and sustainability, accident reduction, conformance to uh, ISO 14001 for sustainability, energy consumption reduction, and on and on. These are absolutely incredible results. These, I believe you would agree with me, are how you spell a competitive advantage. So, that begs the first question. The question is, where do these kinds of results come from? The answer is very easy. It comes from the discretionary effort of engaged workforces. These companies, these individual plants, are able to generate these absolutely astounding performance metrics because they've learned how to engage their workforce and tap into that previously untapped source of creative ability. They all run some kind of suggestion system, and they're generating almost 16 suggestions per employee per year. And the great part is, they care enough about their employees to actually implement, what is that, 80% or more of those suggestions every year. They're, they're getting the engagement, they're getting the discretionary effort, and then they're making the effort to do something with that information. So, the next question obviously is, why are the employees of these companies, these best plants that generate these tremendous metrics, why are they so engaged? These companies care about what their employees think, and so they ask them and they act on those suggestions. And what does that say? That says, you value my opinion. I matter to you. They provide training. Tremendous amounts of training. 70 hours per year on average. And that says that the employee says, I can grow and develop. I can achieve, I can succeed. You value me. They also uh, share their, their financial data. Most of these companies share their financial data. So that says to the employee, I trust you. I believe in you as a person. Monetary rewards says, I have a stake in the outcome. The overwhelming majority of these companies provide monetary rewards. Self-directed work teams. What does that say? When you, when you institute and engage self-directed work teams, that says you value my abilities. I can grow. I can stretch. I have the possibility of becoming more. And they also have formal recognition systems in place. 100% of these companies have formal ongoing recognition systems. Of course, that says to the employee, my efforts are recognized. I'm worth something. Aside from the best plants competition and the best plants data, which again goes back over 20 years, which bears out the whole theory of engagement and all this competitive advantage that can be generated, <coughs> there's also a relatively new movement that some of you may have heard about and that is the Conscious Capitalism Movement. Uh, the author, Raj Sisodia, he was co-author in both of these books, he wrote a book called Firms of Endearment, where he studied a large number of companies and their results, uh, and followed that up with Conscious Capitalism. But what's the point? The point is that they discovered that companies that lead consciously, they, they defined this in four quadrants, higher purpose, stakeholder orientation, not just shareholder orientation, but all stakeholders, recognizing the needs and the benefits of engaging all stakeholders. Conscious leadership, and that's what we're talking about here today, is 
conscious leadership, caring about the other, and conscious culture, developing a conscious culture in the organization. So, this relatively new movement called conscious capitalism, what have they found? Well, in Raj Sasodia's research, here are some of the companies that he found to be exceptional leaders, exceptionally conscious in the way that they manage and engage people. Here are the results. Over a 15-year period, the conscious capitalism companies had fully 14 to 1 stock performance over the average standard of goods. 14 to 1 performance. It proves that managing consciously, leading consciously, thinking differently about leadership and how we interact with our employees can have tremendous results, aside from the fact that it's morally ethically beneficial, it's also tremendously performance beneficial. So, I'd like to close today with, with the thoughts of some, some folks that I respect greatly, and then also some of my own ideas. From the New Testament, I think we're all familiar with it, I guess some of us are. Now, if one of you wishes to be, if one of you wishes to be the greatest, you must be the servant of all. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek. If you're not familiar with Simon Sinek, Google him and look at some of his TED Talks that are available on YouTube. Tremendous mind. But Simon Sinek says, you know, in the military, they give medals to people who sacrifice themselves. But in business, they give the rewards to people who sacrifice others. You go backwards. Derek Ardiha, founder of Visa. Again, talking about servant leadership. Talking about putting the needs of others before ourselves. Conscious leadership. Enlightened leadership. Of course, I have to add my own. <laughs> when I wrote my book back in, when I started writing the book back in 1995, I created the word entrepreneur. So I took two different words, altruistic and entrepreneur, and I mashed them together and created the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is one who needs an organization with conspicuous regard for all stakeholders. Conspicuous is very important because I may have great regard for the need. And I may hold it in my heart, but if it's not conspicuous by my actions, if it's not conspicuous by what I say and what I do with the need, then he never knows it. And he never gets the, the inspirational value and the relationship doesn't develop because leading is all about relationship. So I want to go back to where I started. These four beliefs inform all of the work that I've done over the last two and a half decades. They inform the entirety of my book. And they inform every talk that I give. The vast majority of people are basically good. They want to do a good job. They want to improve and they want to grow. Everyone, everyone is really good at something. And the greatest motivator in the workplace is meaningful work. Creating, implementing, and executing meaningful work. And lastly, people, purpose, and profit are not mutually exclusive business choices. So, I'm sure those of you who are thinking about this and internalizing this, you may be asking yourself, how do we do this? Where do we start? I want to close by beginning to answer that question for you in the words of my favorite poet, David White, from a poem called Start Close In. David White says, start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in, the step you don't 